Hi everyone and welcome to learn A-level biology for free with Miss Estrick. In this video I'm going to be going through cancer and different types of tumours and tumour formation. So first of all just what we mean by cancer. So this is a result of mitations in genes that regulate mitosis. So there is a link here to the cell cycle and mitosis. So if you do have a gene mutation in one of the genes that regulates mitosis, you'll potentially create a non-functioning protein. And that protein, which role normally is to regulate mitosis, so indicate when mitosis should begin and when it should stop, if it's now non-functioning, that won't be the case. So you get this uncontrolled mitosis or cell division, and that creates a tumour. And some of these tumours are cancerous. So there's two types of tumours. You can either classify a tumour as being benign or malignant. And that's what we're looking at here, a benign tumour and a malignant tumour. And you can see some obvious differences in their appearance, but we'll go through all of the differences in a lot more detail. So benign tumours, first of all, these grow potentially large, but at a very, very slow rate. They're non-cancerous, and the reason for that is due to these key properties. So benign tumours produce this adhesion molecule or this sticky substance. And what that does is it causes the tumour cells to stick together but also to stick to a particular location in the body. So one particular tissue. These tumours are also often surrounded by a membrane or a capsule, and that makes sure that the tumour that is growing sticks in one place, it cannot break off and spread, and that makes it much, much easier to remove by surgery, and it means they're very unlikely to return because all of those tumour cells are contained within this membrane. So for that reason, the impact of benign tumour is localised to the area that it's growing. It's often not life-threatening because it's much easier to remove by surgery and it can't spread, but it does depend on the location of the tumour. For example, even if it's a benign tumour, if it's in the brain, that is still very dangerous because it's very difficult to um, remove the tumour from the brain without damaging the brain tissue. And also, if the tumour is growing, even if it's growing slowly, that's going to be putting pressure on the brain against the skull and, again, potentially damaging brain tissue. So it does depend on the location. If this was on the skin, it wouldn't be an issue at all. It'd be very easy to remove. Now, in contrast, malignant tumours, these are the cancerous tumours, and they grow much, much quicker. Not only that, but they also become large, and the cells have the ability to become unspecialised again. Now, the key properties, though, are these ones below. So they don't produce the sticky adhesive molecule, and they are not contained within a membrane, this capsule. So for that reason, they can metastasize. And what that means is some of the tumor cells can break off, transport in the bloodstream, and then become lodged in a new place in the body. And that results in secondary tumors starting to develop. As well as that, because they're not in this capsule, they could also grow projections, which is what we're seeing here. It's not all contained. It's starting to grow and spread in the first location. And it can develop its own blood supply. And once it has its own blood supply, it's getting lots of oxygen and glucose. And that is why the cells um, divide more and more rapidly. So it can be life-threatening mainly because of the fact that it's much harder to remove these tumours and to make sure you remove every single one of these tumour cells so you don't get reoccurrence. And that's because of this metastasis. 
and if the tumour has spread to new locations in the body, in order to remove that cancer, you would have to remove every single one. And sometimes it might be hard to locate every single cancer cell. Sometimes they might now lodge in organs, which would be very, very dangerous and harmful to perform surgery on to remove parts of, for example, the lungs. So that's why with cancerous tumours, so malignant tumours, sometimes surgery is an option. Um, if it is an option, it's often complemented with radiotherapy or chemotherapy. So radiotherapy is radiation to kill the cancer cells. Chemotherapy is medicine, so drugs, chemicals, to slow down the rate of cell division of malignant tumours. So how do these tumours develop then? We've gone through the two types of tumours, but how do these tumours develop? And there's four key ideas. So we said it could be this idea of a gene mutation in um, a particular gene that controls cell division. And that could be a gene mutation in the tumour suppressor gene, which we'll come to, um, oncogenes, or it could be in both. Um, third option, it could be abnormal methylation of a tumour suppressor gene or oncogenes. And the fourth one, increased oestrogen concentrations. So we'll start with this idea of oncogenes and what are they? So oncogenes are the name of the mutated version of a proto-oncogene. And the proto-oncogene creates or codes for a protein which is involved in controlling cell division. And the part of cell division or mitosis that it's involved in is it initiates DNA replication in interphase. So that gene is needed. It's needed to initiate that DNA replication so mitosis can occur when the body needs to make new cells. However, if you do get a mutation in a proto-oncogene, we then call it an oncogene. And that can result in that oncogene being permanently activated, meaning it will constantly cause the cells to divide, even if you don't need new cells in that location. And that's how you end up with these tumours, this excess growth of cells in a location they should not be in. So the other gene which controls mitosis and the cell cycle is tumour suppressor genes. Now these ones, um, the name pretty much tells you what they do. So these are the genes which produce proteins involved in slowing down cell division. So it starts to slow down mitosis to end the creation of any new cells. They can also create proteins which cause cell death if a copying error in the DNA has been detected. So they're responsible for slowing down mitosis and also for destroying cells which have been detected to contain a mutation. So if you get a mutation in your tumour suppressor gene, that means you won't be producing the correct proteins and therefore cell division won't be slowed down and it will continue at a rapid rate. And if mutated cells are generated, then they won't be identified and destroyed and they can continue to develop in the body. So an example here are these two particular genes, which are known that if those two, uh, those are mutated tumor suppressor genes, and if those two do occur, it's linked to breast cancer. So that is one particular type of cancer where there is a strong genetic link um, because that mutated gene, either the BRCA1 or the BRCA2, can be passed on. So the next one links to the idea of epigenetics. And if you've not seen my epigenetics video, I'll just link it up here so you can fully understand epigenetics first. So abnormal methylation. So this is when methyl groups are added to DNA and that can have an effect on transcription. So whether a gene is turned on or off and therefore the protein that it codes for will either be made or it won't be. Now, if a tumour suppressor gene is hypermethylated, meaning that lots of methyl groups are added to the DNA in the tumour suppressor gene, that results in the gene being turned off or inactive. 
So the tumor suppressor gene isn't mutated, but it has been turned off. So the proteins that are needed to slow down mitosis aren't being made at all. Or you can have the opposite idea. In an oncogene or a proto-oncogene, um, you could have hypomethylation. And what that means is you don't have very many methyl groups binding to the DNA at all. And as a result, the gene will be permanently switched on, meaning that you'll have lots and lots of the proteins being made, which initiates the cell cycle. So the last idea is increased estrogen concentrations. And this one links to why women are more at risk of developing breast cancer as they get older, and in particular after the menopause. So before the menopause, estrogen is produced by the ovaries, and that is to regulate the menstrual cycle. But once women go through the menopause, estrogen's not made in the ovaries anymore, and instead, it's made in the fat cells in breast tissue. And that's what we can see here, some of those fat cells in the breast tissue. And that will then mean that estrogen is mainly being produced and it's localized to that breast tissue. And that is what is causing this link to breast cancer in women post-menopause. And the reason for that is that estrogen can interfere with the transcription of the genes involved in the cell cycle. Now this has an even bigger knock-on effect because that can result in tumour, a tumour starting to be produced. And then a tumour itself can result in even more oestrogen being released. And that will then result in the tumour increasing in size. It will also attract white blood cells and both of these factors increase the tumour size at a faster rate. So the last paragraph just down here is explaining what I was saying earlier. So why oestrogen has this effect. And it's thought that oestrogen can activate a gene by binding to a gene that initiates transcription. So therefore, if that is the proto-oncogene, that proto-oncogene is permanently turned on and therefore it's constantly producing the protein which activates cell division. So that's why you get the tumour in the first place and because you get an excess of oestrogen in the breast tissues after menopause, that's why the tumour develops in the breast and the reason the tumour grows so rapidly is because the tumour encourages even more production of oestrogen. So that is it for our cancer and different types of tumour lesson. Hope you found it helpful. If you have, please give it a thumbs up.